and then I'll share the agenda. Oh, wrong. Uh, let's see. Can everyone see the agenda? Yep. Yep. All right. Sorry, my screen. I have a lot on my screen right now. Oh, there goes my camera. Yeah, you're working. Okay. You're, you're an angel. You have a halo around you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I guess we can begin with announcements and uh, people can learn about this in the minutes <laughs> uh, after, after the meeting. Um, I went to a meeting of the Homelessness Committee for the Pioneer Valley or uh, whatever it is to end homelessness, project to end homelessness. I think I'm losing my memory here. Um, anyway, uh, a couple of things to mention from there. One is that Craig's Doors is expecting to start um, in October, in, uh, by October 1, if not a little earlier. They and the other uh, shelter providers in Western Mass are expecting more demand and potentially less space less space. The less space is because they have to do social distancing and as a consequence the shelters that the existing shelters can accommodate as many people as they did last year. Um, Craig's Doors expects that uh, I think they'll be able to accommodate 15 at the Baptist Church and they've also received, I think it's called an ESG emergency solutions grant that would allow them to have 20 motel rooms that they can use for shelter on top of the 15 uh, cots at uh, the Baptist church. Uh, they've also added a seasonal shower to the trailer. Uh, so if someone wants to take a shower more or less outdoors, <laughs> that'll be available, or I mean, it may already be available actually. I, I can't imagine they'll be using it much beyond September. Uh, let's see, I had a couple of other items related to that. Um, I don't know if anybody else but me is interested in this, but, uh, the uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley serves as the continuum of care for the three Western counties, Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire. And for years, they've been using a homeless management information system that was purchased and sponsored by DHCD. Uh, for whatever reason, DHC is no longer going to be uh, using that system beyond, I think it's 2021. And so uh, the COC has to procure a new HMIS system. There is a committee that's formed that meets, I think, weekly to decide essentially what the requirements should be for a new system. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that, I can give you more information. Um, let's see. That's, uh, I had one other thing to mention, and that is I received a, uh, a notice from Katie Bossy, who's working on tracking the emergency rental assistance programs for Mass Housing Partnership and CHAPA. Anyway, Katie reports that the program's really growing. Um, as of August 6th, 63 communities 
have adopted such program, up from 48 uh, from in the initial survey, which was taken during the month of May. The total amount of local funds pledged is now over $30 million, and more than half come from CPA or local housing trust funds. So that's the status for uh, that. Uh, I think that's it. Does anybody else have any announcements? I'll just say that, um, you know, if you were on earlier, I was talking about the block grant funds, the CARES funding the town applied for. The town did receive, you know, $321,000 and we're trying to get contracts going. So Craig's Doors will receive about 20000 for the resource center to help homeless individuals find housing or, you know, receive counseling. Family Outreach is receiving 52000 to help households, um, you know, with their housing stability and find housing or not lose their housing. And the Survival Center is going to receive 90000 for their food pantry. Uh, so those are three services that hope to be up and running soon. And then um, 160,000 is going to Valley CDC for microenterprise assistance to small businesses in town. That might take a little longer to get going, but it is, you know, uh, we have contracts at least get going and getting in place. And you also said, Nate, I think at an earlier meeting that uh, this program will basically replace the $250,000 that we're spending on the emergency rental assistance program. Is that right? Yeah, so there's, well, the town can, um, there's two uh, kind of pots of money the town can use to get reimbursed for COVID expenses. There's state, um, money going through the state and then money through FEMA. And um, through the state, uh, the town, I think can get up to, um, it's a few million, I think it's a little over, a little over 3 million. Um, but anyway, since this uh, money from the trust was an unanticipated expense and it's directly addressing COVID, we can, we, we, I think the, sh the town's finance director has already put it on the reimbursement request. So all of it will come back um, in the end, which is great. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't think that, you know, we didn't do it because of that, but it's, you know, it's nice to think that we'll get reimbursed. Um, but, you know, like fire, emergency response, you know, all the things that the town's been doing with COVID is all. I, I didn't realize like how much, you know, they're saying that when, you know, they've had a number of ambulance runs and I guess the expense to clean an ambulance after every run is, is huge and disin you know, the, to disinfect it and all the, all the staff time is, you know, that's going to be reimbursed. But I think the, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's great. It's almost like, well, would we double down our money and put more in, <laughs> but at least we have the ability to get paid back. Right. And you said, we have to expend the money by the end of December. Right. right. Yep. So if we were to spend additional money on expanding or extending the program, uh, is there a chance that could be reimbursed as well? It could be. Yeah. It may, it may be December was, you know, so I, I'm not sure that's the hard deadline, but that's, I think what they're looking for by the end of the calendar year. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Any other announcements? Okay, so the next order of business is reviewing the minutes from July 9th. I think I sent them out last weekend and then again today. Mm -hmm. So people should have had an opportunity to take a look at them. And uh, the question is, are there any changes that Uh, anybody sees that we need. I can share those if people would like. Well, I don't think you need to share it, John. People have had a shot at it. Sure. And uh, if there are no objections or concerns raised, then I think we will uh, simply take the minutes as accepted as transmitted. Any objections? Okay, so has Jana Tetra joined us, Nate? She is, yeah, so we have, I was gonna just mention that we have a few guests. We have Wayling, uh, Jana McGowan, Jana from Community Action, Maura Keen, and then Mindy Dom. Those are the guests tonight. And I'll um, bring Jana on as a panelist to discuss the, um, the next agenda item. 
and for those in attendance, if you, you can hit raise your hand button and John Hornick or I can recognize you who are co-hosts and we can allow you to speak. Okay, and then after Jana, we will uh, hear what Mindy has to say because it's related to uh, other rental issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you want to bring Jana on? She's on. I'm oh, she's here. On. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a brief update on where we are with the emergency rental assistance program. The application deadline has passed. Um, I don't have final final numbers because we still have a few applications to review tomorrow. Um, we received 104 applications. Um, 22 of those did not meet the initial threshold to move forward. So that means that they were either living in subsidized housing, um, was a, either a single person or an entire household full of full-time college students, um, or didn't live in Amherst, which we had a few of those. Um, so those folks got letters right away, knocking them out. Um, of the remaining batch, uh, 42 of them are incomplete. So um, this is one thing that I think we should talk about either tonight or um, at the next meeting about um, what may have happened to those 42 people and why they filled out the online application and then didn't complete their application. Um, some of those people didn't even respond to emails or phone calls from the staff asking them for additional documentation. So I think that's um, interesting, something that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, I, so far, I have 11 that are approved, 15 that are denied, uh, 11 left to look at tomorrow, and two that withdrew. Um, of the 11 that are approved, so far that would cost basically uh, $23,542. Um, so if the remaining 11 were all eligible and cost about the same, we'd have about maybe $50,000 to spend in round one, which would mean we would not need a lottery, I don't believe, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we need a lottery. Um, of the 15 that have been denied so far, um, the two biggest reasons are that they're over income. Um, mostly that is because of unemployment, um, though not entirely. Some of them also had um, pretty significant assets. So this is another area that I think uh, somehow something has, was missed in terms of when folks applied you know, potentially not really reading through the eligibility guidelines because we had quite, had quite a few people with significant assets. So they didn't meet the insufficient income or assets to pay your rent. Um, and we've had, a, you know, we've had a handful of people that didn't have a loss of income due to COVID. Um, I think I mentioned this to John of the, I would say anecdotally, we didn't ask this question and we can ask it in round two. We, uh, but in terms of where folks seem to be coming to us from, I would say we had uh, quite a few households that have been working with family outreach, um, quite a few immigrant households um, and family outreach staff actually really assisted our staff in helping to get those folks completed applications. Um, and we had a lot, not a lot, but at a decent number of international graduate students. Um, some who met the, had meet the criteria and have been approved. Um, a few that um, have, has, have significant assets available to them, so they don't meet the um, threshold for needing the assistance. Um, the other interesting thing is probably of the 104 applications, I would say maybe only a dozen of them were behind in their rent, which um, was surprising to us um, in just in terms of like what's been happening up until now. I do think that the additional unemployment benefit um, 
was really helping a lot of folks and they weren't behind in their rent. Um, and being behind in your rent was not a threshold criteria, but it just was interesting to me that so few of the applicants were behind in their rent. Do folks have questions about that, all that information I just threw you? Well, I'd be in, oops, go ahead. Sorry, Rob. I was just wondering what the asset threshold is. So um, the guidelines say that they had to have insufficient income and assets to pay their rent for the next three months. So we came up with, let me just pull it out, sort of a like a math equation to figure out what that is. But basically, um, if their projected household income plus whatever they had in savings, um, 30, if 30% 30 of that was more than their monthly rent, then we determined that was sufficient. So, um, and some people had, you know, $25,000 in their bank account. So if that was, you know, most of the time it was pretty easy to determine if they had sufficient because they had a lot of assets available to them. Um, Other questions or thoughts or observations? I have a quick question. Um, what is the plan with the, uh, I guess, with their 40 incomplete applications? Are they just null and void at this point? Or is there going to be more follow up? Or yeah, what, what's your thinking on that? Um, so the 42 or 43 that are incomplete um, got letters that said, I'm sorry, your application's incomplete. Um, you know, we notified them that there might be another, there'll be another round. And so they would be eligible to, to reapply. Um, some of them had been actively working back and forth with the staff and then just like never finished the application. So I imagine we will hear from those folks. Um, there were quite a few that just never responded to the initial, you know, hi, we got your application. We need to send you some information, you know, please call me back. The staff attempted three times to contact um, folks to you know engage with them and then after three times we we did you know we stopped so um you know we have all their email addresses so i'm you know we can be in touch with them however we want to if when we get, get to round two i think notifying them that the application rounds available again um you know i think uh, they filled out the application already. And so figuring out a way to like, maybe they didn't, won't have to fill the whole thing out again. Um, Cause they already did that part. But um, at this point they're, you know, for round one, they're not in it. And what about, Jenna, we talked about this. I mean, do we, you know, <clears throat> the town, we sent, you know, an email to all the landlords we sent it out to the you know as many social service agencies as we could and we try to cast a, a wide net but i'm not sure if we if it reached people so you know i don't know if you have other ideas on how to continue the outreach uh, um i mean i think and i'll have you know all the complete numbers after tomorrow and i'm happy to come back to your next meeting i think my proposal would be for round two um is that we think uh, that you think about um, what is the real goal of the program and think about are there ways that we could change some of the guidelines to really meet the needs of, you know, if the goal is to keep vulnerable Amherst residents from being evicted, um, I think that uh, maybe not, you know, Right now, subsidized tenants were not eligible because the plan, the kind of plan was that we were going to pay monthly rent going forward. And so you can't subsidize tenants. That really messes up their subsidy. Um, so as a result, subsidized tenants aren't eligible, even if they owned rent, had owed rent arrears. And so I feel like we're missing a group of people that probably owe rent arrears, but were not eligible to apply. Um, and so I, you know, I think we could revisit that group. Um, I was surprised at the number of people again, who weren't behind in their rent. So there obviously are people in Amherst who are behind in their rent. And so where are they? We were not, we didn't reach them. Um, and so I think, you know, potentially including subsidized folks. I also, 
I think that the, you know, in some ways, some of the processes were kind of complicated. And, and so I think we might want to think about how do we make it simpler, um, both for, uh, you know, people to apply and kind of understand what they're applying for. Um, and, you know, it was fairly labor intensive on our end. So I feel like we could, there's things that we could do that would make it a little bit less intense. Um, you know, normally when people apply to community action for financial assistance, they call us, make an appointment, used to be in person, now it's over the phone. We do the application with them um, and then we get the documents that we need. And because we did an online application, I think what we've learned is that people, it was really simple to fill it out and then people hit submit and just, I don't know what they thought was going to happen, but it, they didn't follow through and they didn't, I don't know that they understood what they were applying for. Um, it also, doing the application with them kind of allows the staff to have a conversation, kind of understand a little bit more about what's happening, make more like timely referrals. You know, we have a couple people who really should be applying to Raft because they owe four, five, six thousand dollars in rent arrears. And so, you know, but we're, we're having, you know, it's not as easy to communicate that back and forth when they're not calling you back and they, you know, you're emailing them and then three weeks later they call you back. And so I, I mean, I can, um, I'd like to propose what I, we think could be some addition, some changes that might make it more efficient, um, but also would probably like make the, you know, make a first come first serve model work a little better, work better than a lottery model. So that would be up to you all to decide if that's what you wanted, but. Um, and I also want to make sure we're not, you know, we're also in compliance with what CPA requ you know, requires for income right. or for documentation. So. Sure. Um, so that was my question. And the, the ones that were not completed, mm -hmm. it was a matter of submitting documents versus just the, the application. Right. So what we asked them for was, um, you know, in the, to su submit additional documentation after the online application. So proof of income, something about your COVID loss of or reduction in income, bank statements, um, either a copy of your lease or something that shows that you, uh, what your rent is or what your bedroom size is, you know, things like that. Um, and so some people, uh, there's a release form that we needed to be able to disclose, you know, for us to put their information in our database and be able to disclose things to the town. Um, and so some people just didn't respond at all to those requests. And then there's people who kind of went back and forth and then sort of just fell off. Um, and so, yeah, it was, the, and, you know, I, admittedly this, you know, during COVID, this is complicated, right? In the old days, which was only six months ago, they would come to the office with all of their stuff and you'd make a copy and you'd have an application. And so, you know, it's, we do have, um, people can, could have mailed it if they wanted to. We did have the option to drop it off at the office. And then we also have this Citrix, uh, you know, secure share file system where it sends them a link and they take a picture of it and uploads it. Um, and for some people that is easy. And so for some people that can be more challenging. Um, and so there's just some people that just didn't complete it. Um, I think there's also some people that didn't really expect that we were going to ask them for all this documentation. And some people were saying, no, I don't, I'm not giving you my bank statement. And so, um, it's hard to prove that they had insufficient income or assets if we don't know that. And, I mean, and we don't ask for the whole statement. We're just asking for something that says what their balance is. Well, Tiana, from what you're saying, it does seem like uh, it would be helpful if there was more handholding over the phone or whatever that was involved so that if they submit the online application, the next step isn't might be to email them, but if then you don't hear something to make telephone calls to try to get them engaged. Uh, you know, my impression is people find these processes difficult. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, while you or I might not, they do. And as a consequence, people drop out, not because they don't have a need, but because they just get discouraged and they're afraid they're not going to do it right. And 
it's hard to get around that. But I think you're right. We have to find a way of being able to do that. Yeah. But I mean, if you apply for RAC or other programs, you have to, you know, supply various documents as well. So I, you know, I would hesitate to say I have a program where we don't need to see any income verification or, you know, a lease agreement. It's just, you know, it's like we, we're going to have to collect some documentation from an applicant. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, even when the town's rental assistance, whether, you know, the one that's offered through the health department, we would ask for various, you know, a staff person would sit down. When I used to help administer it, we'd meet with everyone and we'd ask for a lot of information from them to verify that, you know, the funds were, um, you know, going to someone who's income eligible and that they, you know, needed them. So, uh, you know, and that was even for, you know, like $500, you know, it wasn't even for as much as we're offering now. We would, you know, we would have, you know, a meeting and ask for a number of things. Um, I will say that Maura has her hand raised. If John, you want to recognize her to? Yeah, sure. Please allow Maura to speak. Yeah. I was just wondering how you guys were taking into account the loss of the $600 a month from the federal government as of the end of July as part of the application. So um, for uh the last time we talked about this um with john and nate and rita was you know earlier in the in july and so it was we that was when no one really knew what was going to happen with the unemployment um and so we basically at the time of application we looked at what was their income um for many people that included the 600 dollars um if you know, and then we were projecting like what would happen if they lost the $600, you know, come August and, and figured out what their projected income was. Um, so that we did take that into account. And for people that actually applied, you know, right at the deadline, they actually could show in their unemployment statement that they'd lost the $600 because they've already, it's already, had already ended. Um, so we did try to take that into account. Um, those some of those folks still ended up being over income um or had then assets you know was a um it, some of them were kind of complicated so we did try to take that into account um and i think you know for round two those folks will have if if in fact some of them were ineligible their their picture could look really different um in round two yeah i think that we should just automatically transfer all the application uh, applications that came in <coughs> in round one and had income issues or even other issues, mm -hmm. you know, if they weren't obviously disqualifying and get in touch with people and say, we now have a second round, call us. We'd like to be able to talk to you about uh, addressing these issues with your application. If we can do that successfully, then you may still be, or you still should be eligible in this next round. So does that makes sense to you, Jana? Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we uh, actually have a, on our sheet, we have a, like a, you know, hold for round two kind of checkbox. So we are identifying those people, but yeah, I, I agree. I think there are a significant number of people whose whose situation could change for round two. Um, you know, for a practical matter, we had to cut off round one at, at some point. <laughs> Otherwise, we could go on for several more weeks. So, um. yeah, do you think the eviction moratorium? Do you think people were miss are are? I mean, the rents are still accruing, but do you think they just have there's some safety nets in place that they're not feeling pressure? And do you think the fall will change that or? Um, I mean, you know, I was hoping, you know, I thought, like I said, I thought we had pretty good notices. And so I, you know, I don't think to me, we didn't have as many applications as I thought we would have had. So I would, I, would, I thought, you know, we'd be, we'd have had more applications coming in, you know, whether or not they're complete, just, you know, just more applications in general. Yeah. I'm wondering if we have to do somehow a better job of outreach. We mm -hmm. had almost a dozen email lists of one kind or another right. that we're re using to outreach. I think uh, as soon as round two is officially kicked off, we should be getting in 
touch with all those same people mm -hmm. and maybe with some more urgent requests that they follow up with people uh, and get back to us. I mean, we don't know really, other than you said family outreach of Amherst, where people are coming from. Should we add uh, a, a question saying something like, how did you hear about this program? So we get some idea whether people are or are not acting. Yeah, and I, mean, right. I, think, I think we can do that. Um, I also think, um, I mean, I think if you wanted to boost the numbers, again, I would think about whether you want to include subsidized housing for rent arrears only. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a question that, that I was wanting, wanting to ask. So, um, what subsidized tenants are you typically referring to? Because my understanding is, you know, if your income goes down and you're in a Section 8, you can get, you know, re-qualified um, re or, you know, get an adjustment on your rent. So I'm curious about what subsidized tenants are, are in rent arrears. What kind of properties are they in and what kind of rental assistance are they getting? Um, so we tip, I mean, community action in general typically sees a lot of subsidized tenants. Um, I would say that uh, in theory, yes, you, your rent goes down when your income goes down. Um, but in practical terms, a lot of times there's a delay. So if the, the tenant doesn't produce the correct documentation that the housing authority needs, then they don't reduce the rent. And so, you know, um, I used to work at the Amherst Housing Authority. If a tenant called and said, oh, I lost my job, I would say, great, I need a letter from your employer. And then six weeks later, mm -hmm. you might get the letter from your employer, the employer, and the housing authority is not obligated to go retro to reduce the rent for the months that the tenant did not produce the documentation. And so I think that that happens. Um, the other thing that, that you could think about, which we do for some of our other programs that we have different funding for, is instead of asking for a COVID related loss or reduction of income, they just have to have a COVID related reason. And so we've had people who have, who have lost their jobs, but who also have had expenses go up or other things happen. You know, if, you're if your kids were home from school all summer with no camp um, and you had to feed them and, you know, We've, we've been a little bit more flexible. And again, this would have to be appropriate with CPA. Um, I also think that at the employment, unemployment picture changes, we're going to see a lot of different changes going on with the income. I think in some ways, you know, during the time that we were, uh, the application period was open, people had significant, there was, you know, increased SNAP, there was pandemic EBT, if you had kids in school, there was increased unemployment. So some people didn't need um, you know, we're able to pay their bills and maybe in, you know, by October, that's going to be really different. Um, you know, again, a lot of these folks were not behind on their rent and that was really surprising to us. I guess I still question whether or not we can give funding to a subsidized tenant. Is that, I feel like that's a, an, a, an uh, I, I feel like we've tried that before and we've been told no. And I just think that it'd be a gamble then if they are still trying to get a reduction in their, um, you know, if they're working with the housing authority or someone, their administrator to get a reduction and then they're getting income from the town, then, you know, it's not, you know, I don't know. I just feel like that's not going to help them because, you know, that's, that's the best, this, you know, they'd be getting income essentially for a few months. And so then they, they're just going to wait to then get requalified. Right. I, I would not pay monthly rent on a subsidized tenant. I don't think that we, you can yeah. do that, but I was just talking about rent arrears because that would go directly to the landlord, not to the tenant. Mm -hmm. But. All right. John Whaling had a, had her hand raised. Sure. Hey Whaling, I'll, um, you can speak if you're. But I mute now. So thank you so much for recognizing me, everybody. My name is Waylene Greeny, and I'd like to uh, share some of the experiences we have about helping people to apply for this uh, emergency oh, rental assistance. You. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. So um, uh, we help three people, three families apply, and just a small number. And one has trouble producing the lease. And the reason was that she didn't know whether she could stay in the apartment until she found out there's this rental subsidy program. So she applied, so she signed her lease the very, very end, about a week ago. So because she signed a lease so late, Caymans wasn't quite ready to process the paperwork. So we are still waiting for them to counter sign the lease. And because the deadline was yesterday at noontime, so she, as a result, missed out on the deadline. Otherwise, she had every single thing that you ask her for, the income and uh, the verification uh, that she lost income due to COVID and uh, the uh, asset you know, information from bank statement, so on. So we feel really sorry for her. And I think this has to do with the fact that people who are unsure about signing another year of lease due to the uncertainty. So I was wondering if anything can be done to help salvage this one particular uh, application because she's so close and it's really, it's the problem of, you know, unable to get a lease signed back by Caymans. So that's one comment. Do, did, do you did want me to have, stop? have a current lease where she's currently living? She is living at that apartment and she was back and forth whether she should sign it or not. And she wasn't going to sign. But then we told her about this particular assistance and uh, she was feeling much hopeful, much, much more hopeful. So she decided to sign the lease until the very last minute. So because of that, but she turned in everything on time and your staff was very kind to, you know, communicate with her in Spanish and uh, allow her to turn the stuff in, give her the deadline yesterday at noontime. But unfortunately, we still couldn't help her meet the deadline. Well, it sounds like she would be eligible for the next round. Wait, or isn't there, uh, there's a, there, we had a grace period where people could still, if they submit an application on time, follow up with, um, to still get into round one with their information. So if she submitted an application on time, right? Yeah, isn't that true? Like we had a few days where they still could submit, you know, because, you know, the idea is if someone submitted on the last day an application, they may not have all the information, but we gave everyone who submitted an application you know, another week or whatever it was to submit the required documents. Yeah, so the great, you said, I'm sorry, the uh, Nate. Yesterday, but Weiling, it might be helpful. I mean, uh, if you want to email me tomorrow or, or have her call me directly, because if she, she could have given us a copy of her current lease that hasn't expired. So it sounds like there might've been, I don't, we didn't need her lease for September. We would have, we just needed the lease of where she, was living when she applied. So oh. there was a little bit of miscommunication. Okay, I'm so sorry. That indeed was a misunderstanding on our part. We thought that she had to give you a new lease, but she has the old lease still, she's still living there. Okay, um, well, why don't we, um, we could, you could either have her call me tomorrow or we could chat tomorrow, you and I could chat tomorrow and, sure. and try to maybe resolve that. That would be great. And can I give you the second uh, example to show mm -hmm. the difficulties people are having? Yes. Okay, so the second example is just because this is a brand new process. So this particular individual applied on the 4th of August and the deadline was the 6th. Mm -hmm. So when he submitted on the 4th, indeed on the 7th, he received an email through our account asking him to sign a document, mm -hmm. which he did. So we send out the document on the 7th, Friday. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Monday, Tuesday, we didn't hear from uh, your agency. So we thought the process just will, will become obvious to us while we are waiting. So until today, since we didn't receive anything, we realized there was nothing going to follow up on that 7th form the uh, August 7th form that we signed. So uh, we are unsure what, what to proceed because we assume when we sign a form for him on the mm -hmm. 7th, there's be more coming to the email inbox, but there's nothing came through. 
So that's one example. Okay. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, I'm happy to follow up with you tomorrow uh, or with the applicant to see okay. what normally there would have been, yeah, multiple things to sign okay. in well and, and a call from the staff. So, okay. Um, All right. We can investigate that further. Great. That would be wonderful. And the third example is somebody who has. Wei Ling. Um, Excuse me, Wei Ling. Yes. I don't think you need to go through all these examples. Get oh, into okay. the down, please, and go through sure. them with her. Um, okay. I don't think it's necessary for us to take okay. the meeting time to go through that same process Great. more times. But could I give you a reason why I think that the committee should really consider helping people? who already have the uh, subsidies, such as a Section 8 voucher holder, and yet is unable to pay the rent? Well, again, I think um, Jana will do what she's able to in that area. Uh, that's what we discussed earlier. And uh, again, I don't want to go back over that ground. OK, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any ideas about how we could strengthen our outreach to the various organizations in Amherst? Uh, most of them are listed on the agenda. Um, if somebody has a specific relationship with one of those agencies, uh, maybe you could do not the only outreach, but additional outreach to them. Because I think we don't want to let people just go by the boards because uh, we didn't uh, we didn't identify everybody. Well, look at the list and get back to me if there's something you can think you can do with something on that list. Uh, get back to me by email, or if you have another idea for doing outreach, get back to me on that, please. Uh, Jen, I think we might also consult with uh, Laura Reichman. She might have some ideas about how to do better outreach to these organizations in Amherst. Okay. I wonder if, if Nate, there's a, Nate, you sent something to what was called registered landlords? Yeah, so, you know, the- How far uh, is that? I mean, how much of a landlord does that hit? Uh, 600. Everyone who's registered through the rental registration program. So we sent an email out with the flyer for this program. You know, um, I think it went out twice. You know, sometimes it gets. Sometimes you know, if you do a an email like that, we try to send it out in uh, batches so it's not it doesn't go to spam. But yeah. <laughs> I know it did go through because a few landlords called the town or emailed with questions. So I know it it did get received. And some you know, I, I spoke with one today, and they said that you know they want to keep their units rented, right? So they can't apply on behalf of the tenant, but it seemed like the landlord was interested in trying to work with the tenant. So, um, but you know, you don't, you don't know, like if so, say a, a lot of the landlords saw it, are they willing to then approach a tenant and say, here's a program to help you or, I don't know. Yeah. you know, doesn't work that way. But, um, you know, I wrote, you know, we did say community legal aid. I mean, could the, could housing court be a place, you know, we had, I think we had sent it to people in the schools. So then, you know, the thought was that they could then port it onto their, um, you know, their contacts. You know, I, I did the Amherst Human Service Network and a number of social service agencies. We did the bid in the chamber. And I can do that all again. Um, say that, you know, there's round two and it's continued to, you know, applications can still be received. I just, you know, it's hard now because um, at one point we had done um, a while ago with a program, you know, we actually had someone go into housing um, a, a complexes and put something in everyone's mailbox, you know, the housing manager said, sure, you know, in, the, in their rental, in their monthly notice or something, sure, the town can put in something. So we made hundreds of copies and we run around, but it's not really happening right now. So that kind of, you know, that type of outreach isn't, isn't happening. So, you know, emails can get lost pretty easily, I think. So, yeah. So this might be, you know, not a great idea, but um, I know that UMass, um, you know, if sometimes their um, human service or human resources puts information in for employees, I mean, they're looking at possible layoffs and possible, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, um, furloughs that might put people at risk. 
Um, and that's the same thing with Amherst, even though I saw Amherst College was trying to hire. Um, but all of the, is there like a commerce place where all the different businesses could also give it to their employees, assuming that they actually live here in Amherst? That's a good idea. I think, yeah, we can. Again, that could go back to the bid. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's, right, I mean, there's, the, you know, uh, Hampshire County, um, you know, resource center, but there's maybe a few places we could try to get more directly. Um. So beyond the marketing, I want to get back to um, Jenna's suggestion that maybe we tweak some of the, um, the guidelines. And what I would suggest is rather than trying to do that here tonight, that maybe John, Nate, you, me, Jenna, and Dana, um get together and just you know look at how you might want to tweak um the guidelines and then they could be, be brought back do we, we have time right to bring them back to the next well uh, actually no we want to get round one started within a week or so right oh uh, round i'm talking about round two round two i'm talking oh. about round two so for round two, just, you know, for, for example, if we don't do an online application, but rather people can call and then be walked through, provided that's not too labor intensive for Jenna and her um, staff. And then just, you know, some of these other things that have been raised tonight. You know, my, um, my reaction is there were 104 applications, 42 are incomplete. That tells me that there was something wrong there. So, you know, the word got out to, there were, there were quite a few applications, but if almost half of them never returned, um, then maybe the, you know, it was, it was too much, it was misunderstood, kind of what Jana was talking about. Um, sometimes people don't, you know, things that are in writing, they get confused and it gets put into a pile. And, uh, so I'm thinking that, you know, if we could tweak some of the, um, some of the guidelines and application procedures that that could really be a big boost. You know, maybe we, we gain half, half of those 42 people or, or more simply because they needed more handholding. Yeah. 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 My, my hope is right. If they are contacted and can get into round two that they're, you know, they've already started. So we're not, you know, that they can continue to complete the forms. Yeah, I mean, it is, you know, with Wei Ling, what she said, I do think like the back and forth and just the way, I mean, I guess that's the way it is, right? I think it, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's, you know, it's a few weeks of possibly gathering documents, having communication, you know, figuring out, do I mail it? How do I scan it? What do I, you know, how do I make a copy of it if I don't have, you know, um, so, yeah, I mean, I just finally downloaded an app on my phone, some scanning app. I actually downloaded three just recently myself to try to scan documents, and it took a long time to actually find something that worked really well. Um, some of them were, like, in, you know, ineligible, you know, in, illegible, or they you know, are too big. The file size are too big. So, I mean, it was a waste of an afternoon, really. But I think, you know, I mean, so if I, I think of someone who's trying to scramble, and then they're like, okay, well, how do I, where do I go? Like, I'm, I have to go to Staples now, and then, you know, then save them somehow and then come back and email them to community action again. But I don't, but I, I, you know, I do think, for instance, like um, CPA has probably some requirements though for income documentation and things. So I don't know by how much we can relax the process. Is that? I've never seen any income documentation. <laughs> it's their income guidelines, but I've never seen documentation. Uh, whatever we've done, we've said, yeah, I mean, we ask for, you know, when we do other programs, we've asked for the similar things, you know, assets, bank statements, pay stubs. Otherwise, how do you know that they're income eligible? Yeah, I'm not talking about um, income eligibility. I'm just talking okay. about helping, you know, obviously, people right. have to be income right. eligible, but it's, it's more about, you know, how you kind of handhold maybe some folks through the right. documentation right. process. Yeah, I, I think we can get together and talk about simplifying, but at the end of the day, there may not be very many things we can change. The key may be creating a better handholding process. Yeah, I mean, I would, 
I don't, I agree that I don't think we should relax necessarily the documentation, but I will say that the way that we do applications for everything else does not involve an online application. And I do think that applicants feel both a little bit more invested in the process and also connected to the program because they spent an hour on the phone talking to the person who can then really say, okay, I'm going to email this to you. And this is what it's going to happen. Like, I, I think it, it, we don't seem to have this level of drop off for our other programs. And so I do think that it's that personal connection that, you know, we didn't do this time and it's just lessons learned. Like, I mean, no one knew how this was going to go. And I think now that we've done it, you know, I think, uh, it was, you know, a little bit too easy to just hit submit and then not really realize what was actually going to happen next. Um, and I, so I do think some of those 42 could come back and, you know, there might be other folks that just were really intimidated by the online application or didn't realize, I mean, we said that you can call to get a paper application, but we did not get any requests for paper applications, which I was really surprised about. And so, um, again, I think, potentially also changing some of the way we're marketing so it's a little bit more clear. Um, okay, thank you. Now I want to move on to the eviction issue. And I know Mindy is with us. She's still with us. Uh, I sent out a note that I received from Laura Reichman about two local uh, developers or realtors uh, sending the equivalent of eviction notices out to uh, uh, two or more of their tenants. And I know Mindy's been working on that, so I'd like to ask her to speak about that and also um, about the opportunity for the trust and the town to receive money to support affordable housing in the future. Can you hear me, John? Yes, I can. Great, hi everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here tonight. I also, while you were talking earlier, I just had a couple of ideas that I jotted down also in terms of outreach around the rental assistance. So I can email that to you later, John, in terms of maybe some other places. Um, I certainly would amplify it on my social media. I know other places would too, and I have some ideas on where to do that outreach. Um, so as most of you know, there's a state moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. The governor has extended it until the middle of October. It was due to expire um, this month. They extended it for three months. It very well could be extended again. Separately, there's legislation that would establish a moratorium um, in case the governor wants to lift that before October. Um, we had been contacted by Family Outreach around some of these, um, I'd say, threatening letters that some landlords are sending to tenants which not only say you owe this much rent, but indicate that they must pay by, let's say, hypothetically, August 31st, or eviction um, process will proceed, which of course is not, that latter part is not the case. They may be accruing rent that's owed, but at this point, the moratorium would prevent them from um, being evicted. And uh, so we have been working with the Attorney General's office for on a couple of different levels. One, to work with family outreach to see if their program participants um, will work with the attorney general's office directly so the um, AG can take some very specific action. But we also um, have learned that, you know, these kinds of letters are actually illegal. Um, and so the attorney general, and I can put this in writing to you so you can include it in the minutes, um, Maury Healy's Civil Rights Division is now urging any tenant who's being harassed, threatened, or discriminated against to call their civil rights division hotline. Um, and this is considered, this kind of letter is, viewing, is being viewed as both harassment and a threat. Um, tenants who are being unlawfully forced out of their homes, which isn't happening in this case, can also call their police department in the AG. But it's being viewed as a potential violation of civil rights. So, um, what I would say is if you know of people in Amherst who are getting these letters, they can certainly go ahead and call the Civil Rights Division directly. And again, I'll give you the number for your minutes. Um, but they can also call my office if they live in Amherst. And that number is 
461-206-461-2060. I'll also put that in my email. Um, and we can help bring that information to light um, to the Attorney General. And we can also reassure um, the resident that they're not gonna be kicked out of the apartment, that there's a moratorium. But in the course of doing this, we also found out um, one of the people I think that came to our office had a lease that was up in August. And so the landlord was saying, well, the moratorium doesn't apply um, to you after August 31st because you have to leave the apartment when your lease is up um, and you can be evicted at that point. And according to the legislation, people cannot be evicted. Um, uh, they can't be evicted even if their lease is up. The moratorium is pretty firm. The only reason, way a person can be evicted is if they're causing harm to somebody else or if, they're, um, if it's um, criminal activity or lease violations that, quote, may impact the health or safety of other residents, healthcare workers, emergency personnel, persons lawfully on the subject property, or the general public. So it's very much tied to public health and safety issues. Um, and so again, if people have leases that are coming up in July and August, which tends to be the case in Amherst, they actually can't be evicted until like the middle of October at this point. Um, and they can't be forced to move. They can move will, will, you know, voluntarily, but they can't be forced to move. So that's on the eviction piece. Um, are there any questions about that? No, thanks, Mindy. I, um... This is Nate. You know, Hi, when, Nate. Uh, you know, the, the town through John, I guess, you know, we saw, I saw a few letters or family outreach. So I, I did call a few places and South Point was one that sent, you know, notices out in April, May, June, I think even into July. Mm -hmm. And they then worked with their attorney in the AG's office and they sent a correction letter. So I, I was sent that today. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hoping the tenants then received it, but you know, they, Someone brought it to, um, you know, I'm glad someone brought it to, you know, you know, enough people that they were able to get, get, um, get the state involved. Yeah, we also, one, we also called, but if yeah. you have any residents in the future also, Nate, I'm happy to make those phone calls in addition to you. Sure, yeah. You know, whatever yeah, that's yeah. worth, I'm happy to be the state rep calling on behalf of my constituent to tell a landlord to back off. So if that's helpful to you, let me know. Thank you. Well, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I was able to get a letter uh, in 20 minutes and I think it probably took some tenants weeks. So, you know, right. the stress of not knowing for weeks. Um, yeah, and the other one that's interesting with the, the lease is expiring. So I actually have heard that, that a number of landlords are not going to renew a lease saying a tenant has, you know, not paid or they're just not gonna renew it to that tenant. But so that's, that's a nice piece of information because yes. I wasn't clear on that. And yeah, so, so it's, you know, they may not renew it, but they can't evict them until the moratorium is lifted. Right. So um, the tenant may, you know, that may be not so satisfying for a tenant because they may want to stay in that apartment even right. after the moratorium. But the, as long as the moratorium's in place and they're not creating any risk, right. they will not be able to be evicted. So uh, again, if I can be a backstop to you in any way about that or amplify whatever you're doing or stand in support with the town. Um, I'm happy to do whatever is necessary to not only make sure that people get to stay in their homes, but to also support the efforts of the town to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. Um, and we also have contacts with the AG's office. So if it, if it turns out you're feeling like you can't find the right person, you should also reach out to us for that um, mm -hmm. too. All right, thanks. Thank you. Mindy, do you wanna say a little bit about the economic bond bill? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that I've learned in um, my uh, first term is <laughs> that people have a lot of feelings about bond bills. <laughs> and um, some people refer to it as funny money and some people refer to it as actual money, but it takes a couple steps to get to it. I'm in the latter group. Um, because a bond bill is basically reserved, as most, many of you may know, for very high ticket projects, usually building of some nature, where you are going to actually need the money over many years, over a period of time. And so because it's so much money and it's over a period of time, 
it can be bonded and so we're going to borrow money for it. But since the legislature um, doesn't have, um, we can't borrow, um, the governor has to um, actually seek the borrowing, but we can give him the items that are eligible for being borrowed, um, for borrowing money for it. And those items end up in bond bills. And I'm happy to answer questions. And if I know the answers, I'll share them. And if I don't, I can find out. So we have bond bills on a whole range of topics, usually divided by the services of government. So for example, there's a higher education bond bill. There is um, an education bond bill. We passed an information technology um, bond bill. There's a transportation bond bill for like roads and bridges and things like that. Um, but there's also this year, there's an economic development bond bill. And a lot of it was tied to COVID-19 and the economic impact. And so the bond had very specific categories of funding that they were looking to um, fund in the state. And I was able to secure a, a couple of pieces in that bond bill, but two significant ones related to affordable housing for the town of Amherst. So in the economic development bond bill, um, in the house version, um, soon to be, I think, the state's version, there are two items that relate to affordable housing in the town of Amherst. They're each for $250,000. So together it's $500,000. One is, $250,000 for the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust to be used to develop and secure affordable housing. And that's pretty broad and intentionally so, so that you know my th thinking in actually submitting this amendment to the bond was when the meetings that I've attended, there's usually been discussion about how do we get money for land? How do we get money for design plans? This, that, construct, I mean, there's all these, um, associated costs and I thought that that would, is broad enough to maybe be useful to you as a trust. Um, and then another $250,000 for a very particular program in the bond, uh, but it's for the town of Amherst to use to develop climate resilience, affordable multifamily units upon receiving LEED gold or LEED silver certification. And so this is a very specific uh, program that is um, a building slash climate change program, which I assume actually that all construction in Amherst would be eligible for since we have a net zero um, zoning law, like it wouldn't be particularly special, but it's also for multifamily units. The two could be used together, they could be used apart. I mean, I think that the way to think about it now is the money is not allocated. It ha we have to, once it gets into the final bond, which is shortly, it needs to actually have the governor sort of, it needs to be triggered by the governor's request to get um, bonding for it, which will involve some advocacy. But that also means it doesn't have to be spent this year. So if there was no project on the books this year, that's okay. If there's something happening in the next one to five years that folks are saying, yeah, that's money that we might want to try to get out of that bond so that we could um, use it to underwrite a project in Amherst, it would then be available. So I'm pretty excited that it's in the bond. Um, I'm pretty excited that it's a significant um, amount of money. I mean, I'm sorry it's not millions, but as a first termer, I get pretty excited when I see $500,000. So I'm easy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, what do they call it? I'm, a, I'm an easy date, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mindy. Um, really, thank you. You're welcome, and I was happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you for all your work as a housing trust in making sure that affordable housing and rental assistance and that people stay sheltered. Um, it wasn't a big leap for me to think about, well, if I, want to, if I want to be able to try to support affordable housing, who could use the money that is a trustworthy community entity who's always sort of looking out for folks' shelter needs. The, house, the Affordable Housing Trust comes to mind immediately. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Janet McGowan had her hand raised, John. Since yeah, I, was gonna, I saw that. Um, Janet, are you, you want, ready to come on board? Whoops, Janet's. 
because I thought. So, oh, here I am. Okay. Um, so I was thinking when um, Mindy was talking that, it, and Nate might have covered this, that it'd be easier if the town or the Affordable Housing Trust or somebody contacted the major rental management companies in Amherst, as well as the major, um, you know, apartment building owners and say, just to remind them that they can't evict people, because it's like, it'd be easier to kind of put that whole issue to rest, than wait for case by case for people to kind of find you and find where to talk and stuff like that. And so I totally appreciate what the AG is doing, but it might be kind of a um, prophylactic thing just to inform, you know, the local landlords, you can't evict people. The other point I was thinking about when she was talking is that if people are moving their households, you know, planning to move into an apartment on September 1st and someone doesn't leave, they may be displaced because they're leaving another apartment. So that might be another problem happening and things like that. So that, that was it. Great. I think that's a good suggestion. I get, Nate, we could look into um, making an announcement through the landlord list that you were mentioning before. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'd want to have the right language or resource or where to direct uh, landlords, but. Nate, would it be helpful um, for um, my office to approach the AG and say that the town might like to reach out to landlords if they have a letter that they use or they have language that they suggest? You know, the, it occurs to me that that's a great suggestion because I think like South Point's landlord, I think is out of state. Like some of these people may not even know that there's a moratorium going on. Right, I think, you know, right, an issue with Amherst is usually, you know, leases end in August or September, right. just, you know, the, the, with the student turnaround. So, yeah, my thought is that if people are, you know, that they would be getting notices soon. So, yeah, I, that, thanks, Mandy, if you would, because I, yeah. I don't want to, you know, it'd be nice to have something to explain it better, you know, even like a link to send in the email just so. I think I may also have a fact sheet that I can send you, but I think tomorrow we can call the AG's office and at least see if she knows or if they know of any other towns that have done this kind of outreach to landlords. Right. It, it, that would just be sort of an interesting thing to do. And I'll yeah. look and see if we have a fact sheet to send you about it. I think a gentle reminder, and you're right, that people may not even be aware of it. So. Right. Yeah, I think the South Point people were caught. <laughs> I don't think they were aware of it. And um, so they had to get another attorney involved and then, you know, the AG's office. So I think for them, it was a surprise, which, you know, it, it's odd because you think that they would be following the rules in Massachusetts because of the own property in Massachusetts, but they weren't. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I think we're gonna move on now to uh, I'm going to do a brief update of the ZBA review, Amherst Studio Apartments, also known as 132 Northampton Road. If anybody else was on uh, the last meeting or any of the other meetings, um, then uh, uh, you can certainly add to what I have to say. I'm going to be brief. Um, the issues that came up on August 6th, for the most part, seemed to be minor. There was some questioning of where the uh, smoking pavilion is going to be located and whether that would cause more problems than it solves. There were some questions about the appropriate areas for snow removal, um, assuming that they're not going to be needed in the winter. There are parking spaces that are made out of grass pavers. So they won't be quite as oppressive, I guess, um, at other times of the year. And people were questioning whether that was or not appropriate place to put snow. Uh, there were questions raised about the steepness of the incline walking into town. There's about a 0.6 mile walk, I think, uh, from 132 Northampton Road into the center of town and it's a little steep on Route 9 as you're walking toward town. And is that going to be a problem for the residents? Um, the other thing that actually took up quite a bit more time was discussion of the services coordination plan. And they didn't actually finish that. Uh, so that will be a subject for the next meeting. 
some of the other issues will come back uh, and uh, we'll see the other thing that was expected to be a focus at the August 20th meeting is need and density. And finally, the CBA chair, Steve Judge, said that uh, 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 that would also be a meeting in which he looked to substantial public comment if there were people who want to be there for that purpose. Uh, so uh, I'll keep you updated on the August 20th meeting. It's going to be on August 20th. It'll be at 630 and it'll be via Zoom, the same process that we're using tonight. Are there any other comments about that or questions? John, if we already like submitted and made uh, statements in support of it at another meeting, does it make sense to go do that again at another meeting? It probably doesn't. I think that uh, if you're, they're probably looking for people who haven't made public comment before at the August 20th meeting, unless there's some very special reason where some, why someone would come back. Thank you. Uh, I was going to, I was going to disagree. I'm going to disagree. Oh, okay. Sorry, Nate. I think it would be, I think it's helpful anytime someone wants to speak for it. I, I, I think the ZBA right now, I agree with John, they, they're asking a lot of detailed questions, but I'm, I'm afraid that they don't understand the need or the bigger picture perspective of the comprehensive permit process. And so I'm worried that they're going to say like, well, you haven't satisfied where you're going to put your snow in the winter, or, you know, it could kill a few bushes. I'm not sure I'm going to approve this. And that's really not what they're doing. They're looking at the regional need for of local and affordable housing and any possible, you know, impacts from the project. And so, you know, the ZBA is used to going through this type of, you know, review of a project. But I think if people on the 20th spoke up and said, you know, it is a need, it is something that's important. And, you know, just the bigger picture, because I'm, I, I guess I, I, John, I felt that at the last meeting that they're getting, they're asking so many detailed questions. I, I hope that they're not losing the bigger picture of what's the purpose of this and everything. It's hard to tell, you know, Zoom is hard sometimes. Like you can't really see everyone. It's hard to get a sense for how everyone's reacting. And so yeah. when they spend 20 minutes talking about snow removal, I'm like, oh my goodness, like, are they really, is this like a sticking point for this project? Like, you know, come on. And yeah, the, the smoking bench, like we don't regulate smoking on private property and I get it that they have the ability to do it. But when they get so caught up in that, it's like, do they like the project or not? And so I, I want, I think anytime, you know, people want to get in on the 20th and say why there's need and it's a, you know, John spoke really well at the last meeting. And so I think we need more of that just to explain, you know, um, about it or just say that, you know, it's something that is, you know, we've been trying, the town has been trying to have housing like this for years. And so it's not, I don't know, I just, I just, I'm, you know, the ZBA has been given so much information that, you know, I think, you know, just reminders, even if it's like you, you go on for one minute and you just say, you know, I submitted things before, but I just want to say whatever. And you speak for 30 seconds because otherwise they probably have like 300 pages of public comment they've received. you right. I mean, how, are they reading every letter that was submitted in the last six months? I, you know, we hope so, but. Well, then Carol, Based on what Nate just said, I reverse myself. You <laughs> and everybody else should follow his advice, not mine. The other thing I'll say is that I also have an uneasy feeling having sat through the first three meetings. Part of that comes from the fact that there are only two people who are on the ZBA who actually seem to be doing much speaking. One is the chair and then there's one other member. And the chair asks a number of critical questions. This other member and maybe occasionally someone else will go into an area that who cares? I mean, there was a question about whether pine trees that are on the property line between 132 and what's next door should be taken down and the people next door want them taken down and Valley said they'll take them down. Why debate this? Um, and my concern is at the end of the day, um, people will 
just fall back, frankly, on their biases and say, eh, we don't really like the population being served by this project and find one excuse or another to turn down the permit. <laughs> so that's one theory. My other theory is much more optimistic. It says that the process is going along okay. The chair is being <coughs> um, very focused to make sure that at the end of the day, nobody can say that they weren't asking critical questions and they weren't detailed enough. And at the end of the day, he will lead them to approval of the permit. <coughs> so those are my two theories. As you can see, I really don't have strong evidence for either one. Um, and if anybody else has any thoughts about that, uh, or as Carol asked, are willing to come back to the meeting on the 20th at 6.30, and speak to the issues of need uh, or anything else that makes this an important project uh, to the value of the type of housing, the quality of housing that they're building, et cetera. I think it would be helpful. Since I've already spoken twice, I'm not sure I'm included in that, but I certainly would urge other people to do that. No, John, yeah, I agree. I think the ZBA is asking a lot of good detailed questions for instance, though, you know, they were asking about the storage and the units and their small, you know, studio apartments. And so they want now elevations of the different unit types to show what kind of closet storage they have. And, you know, Valley said, well, in other um, apartments, you know, the tenants just have to prioritize what they bring and, you know, they can't have too much stuff. And so I understand that's important. You know, you want to have a cloak closet and some other storage, but it's hard to say, well, are, would, would they now ask that every unit be made bigger and have a double closet because otherwise they're not going to approve it? And it's just, it's hard to tell if those detailed questions, if it's going to become a hang up for the approval of the project or if it's going to become a strange condition. And but I think they're, they're, you know, it's good. They're going through a lot of detailed questions. They're trying to have different topics for each meeting. But to me, I hope that the meeting on the 20th, when they're talking about the regional need, that to me that outweighs, you know, that some of these other questions that are being asked. Uh, that's all. Okay, any other comments or questions about uh, 132 Northampton Road? If not, we'll move on to the next item, which is a major item for me on the agenda. Um, as I said in another note to everybody, I started out this by thinking, well, should we have a fall housing forum? And once that idea popped into my mind, the next question was, well, what would be the focus? What are our goals? Why do we want to have a full housing forum? And I discovered I couldn't really answer that question because I wasn't sure what we as a housing trust at this point consider to be our primary goals moving forward. And, uh, once we kind of settle those, then we could ask the question of whether um, it would be helpful to have a housing forum, forum to promote those goals. So I sent people a list, and I think I've added to the list since I sent it, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, basically, the list was divided into two parts. And the easy part, I think, are the things that I assume are given goals, given the time we've already spent on uh, these objectives. And I'll just briefly review them. One is, and this is the top of my personal list, is releasing a revised RFP for the East Street School site by November. Basically, uh, it's been almost a year, it will be a year in November when we had the ill-fated RFP that had too many unanswered questions about wetlands and about uh, hazardous materials in the building. And I know it's been difficult, Nate's been working on getting contracts to be able to do both of those things. And I think we wanna get those things done quickly and if it turns out that we have to abandon this project, well, I'd like to know now rather than later. 
On the other hand, if we're gonna go forward with it, I'd like to get a revised RFP out by November, which I don't think is unrealistic. So that's one. The others is to complete our work on the emergency rental assistance program, which again, we have some things to do. And I think we wanna to continue to promote the development of the Amherst Studios at 130 to Northampton Road. So those are the things I consider to be given. Um, I allow some discussion, but there doesn't have to be discussion. If everybody agrees with me, then we'll just vote to confirm that those are our given goals and move on to the other things we could consider. Well, just while we're on this, I do have someone under contract. Well, it's going around town hall for signatures to do the wetlands and bring that to the Conservation Commission. So that's, that's kind of a big piece. We hadn't done that fully to know the land constraints on the East Street School site. So we do have someone who's going to be doing that soon. And again, I think we can't do the, even if that goes well, mm -hmm. we can't do the RFP unless we also have the assessment of hazardous materials in the old school. It's less critical, but it's not unimportant. Right. right. And I think if we do the East Street School, I will say that, you know, uh, the town met with Valley and there's, you know, I think that the trust would wanna, we could go back and review the RFP and maybe restructure some parts of it. So, you know, just, I, I still think it's something that, um, I think the council actually asked the town manager recently about what's happening there. So there's been, you know, been discussion of that site. So I think it's something to trust, you know, this calendar year to go to do that again is, is, is a good thing. Any other discussion or comments about this or the, the three given goals that I outlined? Uh, that's not clear. Okay, then uh, I will call the question. All those in favor of accepting those three as given goals uh, for the coming year, uh, say aye, and I guess we need to do this person by person. Carol? Aye. Will? Aye. Rob? Aye. Erica? Aye. And obviously I'm a yes. So that passes five to zero. Now, the other things that are on there, um, uh, and actually there's one missing that I thought of earlier today, and I'll just mention that. Um, we used to have a homeless subcommittee that looked at what we can do on issues related to Craig's doors and homelessness generally. Uh, and that committee consisted of myself, Jay Levy, and Nancy Schroeder. Well, two thirds of the committee is gone <laughs> and it hasn't met since Nancy left. So I think that's another area that we should consider um, in many of these things. Um, I'm the only active board member other than outside of our meetings who are working on these things. So at the same time we're talking about them, I would be interested in knowing um, what specifically um, any of you might be willing to put some time into as well. That remind me that we had a subcommittee that was meeting for a while about uh, making it easier to get rental figure out what was going on in the rental market. We, we went around and interviewed some people and then COVID hit and we never got back together after that. But it was a subcommittee of this committee and it uh, kind of just ground to a screeching halt. Yes, it did. And actually, you, I don't know why, but that reminded me of one other thing that I thought about <laughs> earlier this week, but didn't get on this list. And that is revising and resubmitting the draft affordable housing plan for the town. Yes. Yes. Um, again, it's been almost a year since town council tabled it, as I say, later in our agenda. Uh, there is expected to be a meeting now. I think it's next week or the week after I've lost track in which the 
uh, Community Resources Committee will take that up, but nobody's rushing to deal with it. And I'm also a little concerned about that. So we have our list um, and I don't think we necessarily need to do it strictly in order. I'm interested in whatever comments people have about what's on the list and what they think is most critical. I was going to add, John, that you know the planning board and planning department is looking at zoning in the next year, and so I don't know if, and I think it would be good for the trust to, whether or not initiate zoning change, but you know be a part of that discussion. So you know whether it's revisions of inclusionary zoning or, you know, for instance, um, you know the planning board has discussed uh, updating the definition of apartments or how multifamily is allowed uh, in different zoning districts, and I think those are pieces that the trust could be involved in. So I, I, you know, I don't know, you know, if it's, you know, how that, if it's a subcommittee or if it's just, you know, being uh, asking to be sent um, information, but I think it's, I think it'd be good for the trust to just stay up to date on that. Yeah, it seems important to me if the, if the zoning changes work probably really slowly but maybe they make a difference in the long run and not being not being at the table or not really looking at it and trying to figure out what would seem to make sense to us would seem to be a mistake that's a really negative way of saying it's a good idea to look at <laughs> so nate you could add it was improving access to rental oh, housing improving access Oh yeah, there was just an email about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, um, yeah, I mean zoning's, I think some people, it is maybe, people consider esoteric, but it is a pretty powerful tool. So, you know, for instance, we were looking at the 40R uh, district, which may or may not move forward, but there, I think it brought out a number of different um, points of discussion that the town could have. And so, you know, the planning board may have them, but the trust could also, um, you know, encourage the planning board to have some of them if we think that, you know, it's worth it. Um, and that could go hand in hand with updating the strategic plan. If, you know, in the plan, there's a few strategies that were recommended and maybe those become, um, you know, brought out again through zoning or other regulations. Well, Carol, since you've already been active in this discussion, I'll go to the well and twice and ask if you have anything else you want to say or talk about what particularly is important to you. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is I was part of the subgroup um, increasing access. And so, yes, COVID did hit. Um, and so for me to look at this, I really need to think about what are the different steps um, and how can I actually participate, you know, from, from afar, from, you know, tele, tele participation. Um, because, uh, I mean, at this point with COVID, <laughs> triple E and anything else, um, my days are pretty long and extended. Um, so I, I'd want to commit to something that I can actually fulfill. Um, and it's, it's hard to figure out what all the different steps are and what the commitment is to that. Mm -hmm. I will say I thought about it briefly and left it off because what I was hoping, when we get through the emergency rental assistance program, there might be some lessons learned there to come back to this issue of improving access mm -hmm. to rental housing. And that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. John, are you, are you envisioning these additional goals to be, you know, like a year, a year, like a, for next calendar year? There... Yeah, I mean, you know, it could be the next academic year if we're talking September through June mm -hmm. or, or August, whatever. But yeah, uh, I don't have a strict timeline in mind, but it isn't something we're going to try to accomplish in the next two months. Right, right. <clears throat> Some of these things even if we worked on them in the next year, might not get completed in the next year, but that, so that seems 
I guess maybe that seems okay. I don't know. I mean, that's an argument for getting started now, Carol. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but I I just don't want to make like, if you look at that whole list and say we're going to do all those things this year, that seems kind of like that's just not going to happen. So to me, it's helpful to at least acknowledge that these are the other additional things might be things that we're working at trying to get started on or to be moving on, not necessarily to complete. It makes it seem more real to me. Well, some things are involve more staff time than committee time. For example, the first item, evaluating additional town property for affordable housing is mostly falls honestly on Nate, uh, to some extent on me and to some extent on Rita, Um, but other members aren't necessarily deeply involved except to approve expenditures uh, related to evaluating those other properties. So in a sense, that falls harder on uh, Nate, Rita, and myself than anybody else, Uh, whereas the other things are going to involve, in addition to me, at least one and maybe two other people. I mean, our legislative active advocacy now consists of me talking to or emailing with Mindy once or twice a month, which has been valuable, I'll say. And also I contact Joe or her staff also about once a month, so a little less frequently. Um, and that's our legislative advocacy. The difficulty is when it comes to kind of following up on specific legislation and urging people to support it, particularly when I look at Chapa's email, I just don't have enough time to get to it. So again, if there was somebody else interested in that, um, it would strengthen us in that in that area. Uh, Will, Rob, to either you. Yeah, have- well, well, specifically to that, John. I mean, I would be interested in sort of lending my uh, lending a hand in the legislative ad- advocacy side of things. Um, that's something I'd be interested in helping out and sort of learning from you along the way. So, okay, I'd be glad to talk with you about that, and we'll think about how we can be a little bit more active than I have been. Other thoughts? Well, I think what I'll do is bring this back to the next meeting, that is the additional goals, and hopefully people have an opportunity to consider um, what they think we should set as a priority between now and our September meeting. And uh, hopefully we can reach more resolution by the end of that meeting. I can commit to reviewing um, the, our plan, our strategic plan. Um, I mean, I think it's gonna take probably, you know, a focused couple of meetings to think about changes, but you know, taking a look at it, um, you know, identifying areas where we might want to have conversations, um, you know, facilitating those conversations and doing the edits, I certainly can do that. You're talking about the draft affordable housing plan, Erica? No, the review oh, and change they are a strategic plan. It's uh, the third bullet down. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> I remember writing it and then when you just said it, I'd lost track of it. Okay, great. Uh, Yeah, it's really a question of looking at what's there and asking, are there things missing? Are there things that should be added? Are there things that we're not doing that we should take out of the plan? Okay, I will leave it there uh, and we'll move on to the other few agenda items. Uh, 
in general, these will not be long. And in fact, we've considered most of them. Uh, okay. Uh, I mentioned that uh, interest in town housing policy seems to be growing. I noted a few minutes ago that the town council community resource committee is beginning to work on a general town housing policy. The, the primary explication, explanation for uh, tabling the affordable housing policy was that we really needed a more general policy that would incorporate affordable housing. And without that, we couldn't move forward. That I should say is not my opinion, but that was what town council decided. Uh, so that's where that is. And uh, if anybody is interested in following it, uh, I can send out a note about when Mandy Joe plans to have hearings on that. There is one planned uh, yeah, for Tuesday, August 18th at 2 p.m., which is when that committee typically meets. Again, it'll be a Zoom meeting. Uh, that item was on the last CRC calendar or agenda, but it was canceled at the last minute. So we'll see. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned is that the Energy and Climate Action Committee or ECAC of town council has decided to develop a broader policy on yeah, the, what's called the town's climate action adaptation and resiliency plan. It has four task groups. I'm sorry, I can't remember the names of all the others, but there is a building task group, which I was invited to be on. And as I recall, there's also a land, land use or zoning task groups. And then there are two others. And I may have sent people the link to that or information about that. I don't have it handy at the moment. Uh, honestly, I don't know what will come of either of these, um, but is anybody interested in following it? Let me know and I will keep you informed. I'm interested in following it, but I can't do anything on August 18th. Well, it probably will be recorded by by uh, in Zoom, so then you get to watch it for fun later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the entire meeting not may not be focused on that, Carol. So, assuming I am there, uh, I can let you know what parts of the recording to focus on, uh, or uh, whether it's worth listening to at all. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> Uh, any other questions about these? Okay, we've done legislative updates, except I, for one area, which is honestly confusing to me. Uh, we formally um, supported a bill that would allow counsel for people who were being evicted. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, honestly, whether this is another bill that's related or it's part of the same bill, but the legislature is now considering legislation that would allow a pilot program of having counsel for people who are being evicted. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple of notes asking for legislative support, but as I said, I haven't had the time to follow up to decide whether or not that's a new request or it's one we've already met. Does anybody else know anything about that? Okay, well, uh, if I can, I'll do a little bit more research, but uh, it, it's more likely because I don't think it had passed as of the end of the session last week. So it's more likely to come up when the legislature reconvenes in September, October, whenever they get back into session. 
upcoming events. I've mentioned these, the Community Resources Committee meeting, the next ZBA hearing on August 20th, and our next meeting, which will be on Thursday, September 10th. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, any public comment? I don't see anybody with a hand raised. Um, any items not anticipated that we haven't gone over? Someone wants to offer something that we should discuss now or might be taken up in the next meeting. Well, then I think I will move to adjourn. Is there a second? Carol? Yeah. I think I won't do a roll call. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you. your participation and look forward to our next meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Nate.